morning. My name is Jonathan Guyquad. I'm an internal medicine resident at Oklahoma State University Medical Center, and this is my case presentation on an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction in the presence of pneumoperitoneum. Myocardial infarction, more commonly known as a heart attack, is a relatively common occurrence with a wide array of potential etiologies. Many, if not most, MIs result in typical symptoms of angina or chest pain or anginal equivalents such as shortness of breath, nausea, or vomiting, which often is the primary driver to the diagnosis. In patients who are unable to communicate symptoms, such as those who are intubated and sedated, this can be challenging. In this case, we discuss a patient who is intubated and sedated who develops a myocardial infarction in the setting of a pneumoperitoneum. Acute myocardial infarction is the most common diagnosis in hospitalized patients in the industrialized countries. A ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, which we'll from now on call STEMIs, is due to the sudden decrease in coronary blood flow due to a thrombotic occlusion. Initially, a plaque forms in the vessels mainly composed of lipids. This plaque development is secondary to risk factors such as hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and smoking. Though we are unable to predict when someone may suffer a STEMI, we can determine their likelihood to have a STEMI based on their risk factors and subsequently mitigate those risk factors. STEMIs that occur in the inpatient setting typically occur in those older in age, female, and those with more comorbidities or risk factors. MIs also occur in those with increased inflammatory states, such as those who are critically ill or severely ill in the inpatient setting. ST segment elevation in the critically ill is a relatively common finding, which may not always reflect a truly ischemic process. This is likely due to the elevated inflammatory state in these patients. The main difference is that the patient population lacks the ability to verbalize chest pain, which confers a greater specificity to the EKG findings seen in non-critically ill. The case report is that of an 83-year-old female presenting to the ED due to increasing abdominal pain in association with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. The patient has past medical history significant for hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and ESRD. Of note, the patient was discharged two days prior to her most recent admission due to diverticulitis. She represented due to worsening symptoms. A, cl a clinical diagnosis of sepsis secondary to diverticulitis was established. The patient was subsequently started on empiric antibiotic treatment. Her initial CT did not show any evidence of free fluid or abscess. As the patient's clinical course progressed, her symptoms did not subside and her WBC count continued to increase while in empiric antibiotic therapy. Infectious disease was consulted who brought in patient's antibiotics out to erdipenem and recommended a repeat CT abdomen pelvis due to the patient's continued symptoms in the setting of a persistently increasing WBC count. Repeat imaging showed evidence of moder moderate pneumoperitoneum and free fluid in the right lower quadrant due to sigmoid colon perforation. General surgery subsequently performed an XLAP with sigmoid colectomy. Patient was also noted to incidentally have an elevated troponin at this time of 0.06. Patient's post-operative EKG showed a right bundle branch block with inferior ST segment elevations consistent with acute coronary syndrome. Once patient had undergone surgery, she was taken for emergent PCI in the setting of inferior lateral STEMI. Due to patient being intubated, it is unknown if the patient was experiencing concomitant anginal symptoms. Patient was found to have a 99% occlusion of her, the left circumflex artery. Significant ulcerated plaque in association with thrombus was also noted. She underwent successful IVIS guided PCI with mechanical thrombectomy and placement of two drug eluding stents to the left circumflex artery. Patient's post operative echocardiogram did show evidence of mild septal and inferior hypokinesis with a new reduced EF of 44%. After coronary intervention was performed, the patient was started on rectal aspirin and IV cangrelor due to the inability to use the upper GI tract in the post operative period. The patient was transitioned from IV cangrelor to oral to cagrelor. She did well from a cardiac standpoint after suffering an acute coronary syndrome. Below in figure one, we're able to see her EKG, which shows findings of, S of inferior ST segment elevation in leads 2, 3, AVF, as well as T wave inversions in 3 and AVF. We can also see the right bundle branch block with the RR prime in V1 and V2 and the reciprocal changes in V5 and V6. She also has a left posterior fascicular block. Her right was tachycardic at 116. PR interval was within normal limits at 168. QRS duration was prolonged at 148, as is expected with a bundle branch block. And the QTC was also prolonged at 511. In figure two here, we're able to see the left circumflex artery here with stenosis in the mid to proximal range. And here in figure three, we're able to see after PCI, there's excellent flow in the mid proximal left circumflex with good distal flow as well. 
In conclusion, this case illustrates the importance of having a high level of suspicion for myocardial ischemia in patients with multiple risk factors who are unable to report angina or anginal equivalents. Physiological stress in the setting of pneumoperitoneum with feculent peritonitis was likely the culprit of this patient's myocardial infarction. It is not indicated to obtain daily troponins on patients who have not complained of chest pain, but checking troponin in EKGs in severely ill patients with multiple cardiac risk factors, especially in those who cannot verbalize anginal symptoms, could potentially save patients from prolonged cardiac ischemia. Thank you for your time.